Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. As we begin, I encourage you to find the handout that you should have received, the smaller size that has at the top sermon handout for 10, 13, 19. If you don't have one of those, raise your hand. There's a couple. Ushers want to get a couple over here by, by Sarah and also over in this section. Okay. So they're coming in with some. What we're going to encourage you to do over, starting now, moving forward, is whether you bring a Bible from home or use your, your phones or your tablets in the pew or use the Bibles in the pews uh, to actually look at the Scriptures, not just listen but also uh, see what it says. And so what we're going to try to do is, is to have uh, a handout that has the scripture references that we'll use in the message that day so we can look at them and look along kind of as a bookmark for today. Coming up in a few weeks, we're going to also give you a bookmark that has on it the books of the Bible so you can maybe keep that in your mailbox and bring it back into, into the sanctuary each week to, to say, well, okay, we're going to Second Kings. Where is that on the list? So I can kind of get an idea where it is. Where it is. So that we get more, more and more comfortable looking at what the Scriptures says by seeing it on the pages or even on your phones or whatever, that's fine too. And so we're going to follow along. And if you notice on the handout, there's a bunch of quotes that are in the, those bullet points. Those are all from that section in Joshua chapter 5. And as I think I mentioned earlier, uh, in Joshua 5, there's probably about three sermons we could preach for all the material that is within that chapter. But we're just going to focus primarily on the tail end of that. And so it begins, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And so we stop there for a moment. You've got hundreds of thousands of folks. Some say maybe up to a couple of million perhaps the people of Israel, they have crossed the Jordan. They are camped at a place that they name Gilgal. Gilgal means rolled away. And in the text, as they are circumcised, it says, now the Lord has rolled away your reproach. God has rolled away your guilt. It's interesting as you begin that Gilgal and Golgotha the hill on which Jesus died, have the same root behind them. And so also on Golgotha, on the mountain of the crucifixion, Christ rolled away our sin. And even in the empty tomb, as the stone is rolled away, we see that rolling away perspective ties in quite nicely with what Gilgal means for us. And so now you've got this up to 2 million people. They've crossed the Jordan River. We saw that a couple of chapters ago. And they're just kind of parked there. And Gilgal is about, well, it's less than a mile and a half. It's about a mile and a third from Jericho. So you've got all of the people in Jericho a huge fortified fortress city. And a little better than a mile away, you've got two million people that you know are coming to take your houses. And you just saw what happened as the Jordan River at flood stage is dried up. And so it says in the text also, the people who are living in the land are kind of freaked out. It says their spirits have dried up within them. They're thinking, man, we're all going to die. And so that's where 
we find Joshua. He's out for a walk, looking at how things are going to proceed. And then it says, he looks up and he finds a man standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. So picture yourself now, you're Joshua. You're, you left your camp and you're walking closer and closer toward Jericho and you're looking at things and all of a sudden there's a guy standing there. And he's not one of your crew, you don't recognize him. He's got a sword in his hand. What's your first reaction going to be? This is not good. Because he's most likely, would be the assumption, he's most likely from Jericho. And he sees me walking close and he figures, ah, here's just one of them, I can get him. So that's maybe what you're thinking. And so Joshua then says to him, are you on our, are you want to be on our side or you want to be on their side? So he gives them two options. Which side are you on? And the next bullet point, what's his one-word answer? Don't you love that when you give somebody multiple choice and they give you a yes or no answer? That, that's not what he asked. He didn't ask him a yes or no question. He said, which side are you on? And he says, no. I am... Who does he say he is? The commander of the army of the Lord. And you see after that phrase on the handout, it says Sabaoth. Can you say that word, Sabaoth? Some people see that word sometimes and they think maybe it's just, <coughs> I'm sorry, somebody misspelled Sabbath. But it's Sabaoth. Say it again, Sabaoth. Sabaoth, Lord and Lord of hosts, mean the same thing, the exact same thing. So they both have Lord in there, so Sabaoth basically means hosts. And hosts and Sabaoth reference the many, many angels that we have in, in heaven. And so Sabaoth, Lord, Lord of hosts, is... The Lord, the boss of all the angel armies of heaven. So this is the guy standing by Joshua, the commander of all those angels. And I want to have you look ahead to 2 Kings, if you would, 2 Kings chapter 6. And, and Linda, if you want to advance it a couple of pictures... Next, one more, that one. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we have a reference to what this picture we see is kind of talking about. And you've got Elisha, and there are enemies of God's people, and they, are, they have surrounded Elisha and the people in the city. And in 14 through 17, it says, So he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city where Elisha is staying. So now when the servant of Elisha, the man of God, rose in the morning, and he went outside, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant says, what are those next three words? Alas, my master. Whenever somebody says, alas, that's normally not a good thing. They're normal, normally thinking, oh, this is bad. Alas, master, look at the hills. The enemy is here, and, and they're going to they're gonna beat us. But then the text goes on, and Elisha said, Don't be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And, and the servant guy is thinking, Okay, I'm in here in the city. I know how many soldiers we have here in the city. And I see those guys, 
and Elisha, I think you're crazy. They are a bigger army than we are. So the servant now is thinking that Elisha has lost his mind. And then Elisha prays. Oh, Lord, please open up the eyes of this servant that he could see. So the Lord opened his eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of what? Yeah, chariots of fire. So, the city is surrounded. And that's what, that's what the servant initially sees. But then God opens his eyes to see the spiritual realm. And he sees around those guys the heavenly host, the angels of heaven, and their fiery chariots. How do you think the servant is feeling now? He's thinking, wow, I can go back and sit down and have breakfast. I might not die today. Because it seems as though it's not the way it seems. And you think about, you've got all these angels, and I want to have you go to Isaiah 37 for a moment. Isaiah 37 is just a single verse. And what page in the Pew Bibles? 598. And if you're in the large print, it's on page 760. Isaiah 37, 36. Somebody want to read that out loud. One angel, one night, 185,000 of the enemy dead. And so you think back to Elisha and his servant seeing the enemy being pretty numerous, but then seeing the angels that are on their side, and one of them destroyed in one night 185,000. So all of a sudden, the things have changed quite a bit. That's quite an army. One angel is quite an army. One of the one of the books that has been out for decades now by a Christian author, Frank Peretti, two books actually, Piercing the Darkness and This Present Darkness. Fascinating books about spiritual warfare. Kind of giving us an idea of a, if we could see behind the scenes like the servant did in that reading, what would we see in the spiritual battles with the demons and God's holy angels. And, and so we, we think about this situation and we realize the, the, the power of an angel and think, wow, this is impressive. And so Joshua, who hears that this guy is the commander of all of these angels, he does what probably we would want to do too, and he drops his face to the ground and worships this commander of the angels. Now, it's, it's probably a, a nice thing that he's doing, but we need to understand. We go to Revelation chapter 22. In the last book of the Bible, the last chapter of the Bible, so the very way at the end, the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. And there are a couple of times in Revelation where, where John wants to bow down and worship an angel, and we see a similar response in each of those situations from the angel. And so in 22, verses 8 and 9... It says, I, John, as he's finishing up these, the Revelation writings, am the one who heard and saw these amazing things and these visions. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down and worshipped at the feet of what? The angel 
who showed them to me. But the angel said to me, what? Huh. I am a fellow servant. Don't worship me with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. What are the last two words of verse 9? So an angel comes in and gives this message, and John wants to bow down and worship him, and the angel said, no, 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 no. Don't be doing that. You don't worship angels. I am just a servant. Worship God. And so now think back to what's happening in Joshua, as it shows on that handout. He falls on his face and worships the commander of the angels. And the, the commander doesn't say to him, hey, don't do that. Doesn't say that at all, does he? But in fact, what he does say to him, what's the next bullet point on here? Yeah. There's no place in scriptures where an angel makes the ground holy. It's only when they are in the presence of God himself that the ground is made holy. And so we see quite a difference in that situation from what it would be otherwise. And so you look at all of this and you realize that they are not worshiping angels, but if you are bowing down to worship and the spirit creature says uh, you're on holy ground, that Joshua is probably in the presence of God. And so uh, over, the, over the millennia, this has been understood as, of course, Jesus making an early appearance. So this is the Christ coming down, the commander of the Lord's army, as Jesus is described in a few other spots as well. The King of kings and Lord of lords and all of that is Jesus. And so Jesus has come God the Son has come and he has stood before Joshua on this day and he has said to him, you're on holy ground. I am the commander of the Lord's army and what you're going to see in, in the next chapter of Joshua, you're going to see the amazing things that this commander has the angels doing as they battle Jericho. We think about all of that and, and we go to Acts chapter 12 Right after Acts 11, actually. Page 920, Acts chapter 12, 6 through 11. An interesting situation as Peter, because of his teaching and preaching and such, finds himself in prison. Not the only time that happens for him, but one of these times. So he is in prison. Uh, Acts, 6, uh, Acts 12, 6 through 11. And now when Herod was about to bring Peter out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries or soldiers before the door were guarding the prisoner. So here's the situation. You've got Peter who's been arrested for not being quiet about Jesus. And he's chained to two guards, and there's guards at the door, okay? And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and the light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side. Imagine now you're sleeping in prison next to these two guards, who are most likely snoring, I can imagine, and all of a sudden you get smacked. Hey, wake up. Sure, it wasn't a real hard smack, just enough to wake him up. Woke him up saying, get up quickly. But I've got two guards holding me in place. But the chains fell off. So the angel makes the chains fall off. The angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. He said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed the angel. He did not know 
what was being done by an angel was real, but he thought he was kind of having a vision. When they had passed the first and second guards, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street. Immediately the angel left him. And then Peter kind of comes to his senses, and he says, Wow, I am sure now that the Lord had sent an angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod, and I'm not basically having a dream. And so now, as you see in Joshua, the commander of the Lord's army says, take off your shoes. You're in the presence of holiness. But this angel says to him, what do you do with your sandals? Put them on. So the perspective of the angels and the perspective of Christ is altogether different. Again, saying that there is a difference between being in the presence of an angel, a holy angel, and of God himself. And so we, we go then to the last verse on your sheet, to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. Page 1276 in the large print. What page in the regular print? 1001. Somebody want to read that out loud. And the verses previous to that are talking about angels. The whole big section there is talking about angels, and it's saying about these angels that the angels are what? Ministering spirits. The word minister means servant. All of these angels are servants. They're spirits who are servants sent to serve whom? Who are they sent to serve? God. God's children, just for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Do you know anybody who is going to inherit salvation? Who? Raise your hand if you know somebody who's going to inherit salvation. The Christians. If you are a Christian, you are going to inherit salvation. And so what it's saying here then is that the angels are sent to serve us. As we realize we are in a spiritual battle, we realize that Satan has a lot of power because he's one of those angels and has that power to bring destruction as he does quite often. But God has more angels than Satan has, and he has also the power of God. We see here on the Ark of the Covenant in the picture, again, it's, it's not an actual photograph, it's a, it's a drawing uh, depicting what it might look like, because we don't have that in our possession. It's, it's, God, it's gone. But the top of the Ark of the Covenant that they carried with them through the wilderness, and as they put this onto the Jordan River with the servants carrying it with those rods you see, on top of the ark you've got the two angel figures carved there. And as they put their wings together, they make what is called then the mercy seat, depicting the mercy of God and how his power through his angels and through Jesus Christ is given to us for mercy, for victory. And so as we move ahead into this fall, getting up toward another new year, 2020 is coming, so your visions are going to all be better pretty soon, we realize that we are already victorious, that we don't have to wonder, can we handle this? whatever the this might be in our journey. As we as a congregation look forward to setting budgets and looking for servants to serve in different capacities, we realize that as we rely on God, not rely on us, 
if we rely on our ability to handle things, then it gets all fouled up. But relying on God, trusting his power, his presence, his providence, and his promise, that we are already victorious and that we can step boldly into what he has in mind for us and realize that he'll bring the victory as we are faithfully following him. And so Joshua stands in the presence of Christ. And in the next chapter, we'll see what commands they are given. But if Joshua would have said, uh, I think we'll go this way instead. That wouldn't have worked. That's what happened 38 years earlier. But the people of Israel said, no. So now this crowd is going to listen. And they're going to receive profound blessings as they trust even to step in and to face the massive city, walled city of Jericho. What a great blessing God shows them. Look ahead. Look ahead. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear And grace my fears relieved How precious is Thy grace appear the hour I first believed. And when we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's grace. Then when we'd first begun, we've no less days to sing God's grace than when we'd first begun.